Good day from Denver, Colorado, and welcome to the Government House Weekly Press Briefing and COVID-19 Update for the week of October 26, 2021. As many of you know, I am here in Denver, Colorado in support of the 34th Legislatures and our joint mission to create a safe, well-regulated and profitable cannabis industry in the U.S. Virgin Islands. I am pleased to have Senate President Donna Fred Gregory here with us today, joining me at this afternoon's briefing to share with you all about what we're learning here while we're here on this Virgin Islands Cannabis Summit. And of course, we have our very own Dr. Ellis on behalf of the Health Commissioner in Carnacion to share the latest COVID-19 data and information on where Virgin Islands residents can get a free COVID-19 test and of course get your vaccine this week. But before we go to Dr. Ellis this afternoon, I am really encouraged to see our number of active cases come down to less than 100 territory wide and our seven day positivity rate back down to just over one and a half percent. Great work, Virgin Islands. We are adjusting to our new normal and the reduction of active cases in the territory and, our, and we are in a good position and I think it's a good sign that we are trending in the right direction. I firmly believe that despite the surges, our current number of active cases and our seven day positivity rate are an indicator that vaccines certainly do work. So as we forge forward ahead and adjust to this new normal, we'll begin to be relaxing some of the restrictions that we have had in place for well over a year now. Effective Friday, that's Friday, October 29th at 5 p.m., I order removed the 11 o'clock p.m. moratorium on the sale of alcohol. I'll repeat that. So effective Friday, October 29th, we're removing the moratorium on the sale of alcohol after 11 o'clock p.m. Also effective Friday, October 29th, bars and restaurants may remain open until the closure time indicated on their license. So in other words, we are removing the 12 o'clock and 11 o'clock curfews of uh, drinking and closure. I am also removing the restriction on dancing within establishments. However, you must wear your mask while engaging in this activity. And please try to social distance as much as possible from other couples or other peoples who may be, be dancing too. I am also raising the maximum capacity for vaccinated events to 250 persons. Events organizers must have a green light from the Department of Health and the commissioner can authorize larger engagements at her discretion. Um, I think that's a good number to stop at now, but please remember that we are still in a global pandemic, but we must forge, forge a way forward and relaxing of the restrictions is not an invitation for reckless and wanton behavior. These restrictions can easily be reimposed if we see the behavior that is contributing to our surges. So if, if we just have, you know, adult interaction and we respect the fact that we are in a pandemic, you know, we'll continue on this route. But if we don't see that, I'm certainly um, gonna be looking at reimposing these surges. But in addition to us relaxing these restrictions, we have really making a resolve to return our students to in-person learning. And we are looking to phasing in the school population no later than January 10th following the Christmas break. The reduction in our active cases, however, may allow us to consider an earlier return. So be, a, be alert to that. Our ability to successfully continue ahead to our new normal requires a continuous adherence of the protocols, not only the protocols that are in now, but that were there before. With that, I need to remind the public that all other protocols, especially the mandatory mask mandate, remains in effect. Right now, we're going to go to Dr. Ellis and hear what she has to say about COVID this week in the territory. Dr. Ellis? Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor Bryan. As of October 25th, 2021, a total of 203,238 tests have been conducted in the territory. Of those tests, 7,145 individuals have tested positive. The seven-day positivity rate is 1.67%. 
There are currently 83 active cases in the territory, 67 on St. Croix, 16 on St. Thomas, and zero on St. John. 6,982 cases have recovered, and unfortunately, there have been 81 fatalities. From our hospitals, the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital and Medical Center reported four COVID-19 admissions with one patient vented, and the Schneider Regional Medical Center reported zero COVID-19 admissions. Thank you, Virgin Islanders. It is because of you that are vaccinated and all of those who have been adhering to our strict guidance that we are seeing a decrease in new positive cases throughout the territory. And after weeks of over 100 positive cases consistently, we are below 100 active cases with only 67 active cases on St. Croix. Our positivity rate has decreased by almost half, and I would like to encourage the community to continue to get vaccinated, wear a mask, wash your hands frequently, and practice social distancing when you can. With the holidays approaching and tourism travel increasing, we will see intermittent surges, especially since we have not achieved community immunity yet. The Department of Health is also providing free COVID-19 vaccines at multiple locations. Please visit covid19usvi.care forward slash vaccines for details of all vaccine locations or to schedule an appointment online. To get vaccinated, you can also call 340-777-8227 or simply walk into any of our community vaccination centers. Families can also call the hotline to schedule an appointment for homebound relatives. Our mobile strike team will come to the homes of homebound individuals. Now to discuss third and booster doses. Booster doses are available for all three vaccine products for those 18 years and older. I'm gonna repeat that. Booster doses are available for all three vaccine products for those 18 years and older. We also continue to provide third doses for those who qualify. We are committed to making boosters accessible without barriers to ensure healthcare equity during our pandemic response. Please ask the CVC clinical team members if you have a question about booster or third doses. Mixing of vaccine products is not recommended by the USVI Department of Health, but is considered safe by the Centers for Disease Control in the event your vaccine product is not available. We expect to share information in the future regarding COVID-19 vaccines for ages five to 11. Remember to get your seasonal flu shot. We have successfully distributed over 5,250 gift cards as part of Governor Bryan's COVID-19 gift card incentive program. Distribution continues Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on St. Croix and St. Thomas at the community vaccination centers and 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Morris de Castro Clinic on St. John. Distribution ends December 30th, 2021. Thank you to our CVC staff, Ving, DOF, VI Lottery, and all involved in the gift card distribution process. Special thanks to you, the community, for getting vaccinated and participating in this incentive program. As we wrap up Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we must remember that breast cancer screening isn't something that we should only think about in October. Learning the early signs of breast cancer and the way you can prevent this disease is critical. Early detection saves lives. To prevent breast cancer, it is important to live a healthy lifestyle by eating a balanced diet, exercising, and avoiding excessive alcohol use and cigarette smoking. If you are over 40 years old or have a family history of breast cancer, you should be talking to your doctor about breast cancer screening. And all of us should be conducting self-breast exams. Yes, all of us, including men. That includes the male population. For men, the lifetime risk of getting breast cancer is about one in 833. The Department of Health is offering free breast cancer screening at its clinics and on October 29th at the market, St. Croix, formerly known as Plaza Extra West, and the market, St. Thomas, formerly known as Plaza Extra Tutu from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. I am encouraging you to wear pink that day. Halloween is this weekend. Please be safe. To keep up with the latest information, including COVID-19 epidemiology and vaccine data, please visit the U.S. Virgin Islands Department of Health Facebook page or our website at www.covid19 
usvi.com, and for COVID-19 health information alerts, text COVID-19 USVI to 888777. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, and remember you out there, we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Make sure you take your vaccine or your booster if you need be. Um, we got at least another year of, of COVID to deal with. Um, so we just wanna make sure that people are doing everything they can to make sure um, that they stay safe and they keep their family safe. So good news, we made you the promise and we are intent on delivering it. The Department of Finance is preparing to issue checks for the repayment of the BIESA 8% payroll reduction. A lot of you didn't think this was real, but I'm gonna say it again. Finance is preparing to issue the checks for the repayment of the BIESA 8% payroll reduction. If you are a government employee or a former government employee and believe you may be entitled to a repayment of these funds, we please, please, please be begging you that you take some time to verify your claim. You can do so by visiting the Division of Personnel's website at www.dopusvi.org. Click the tag at the top of the page that says employees, then click on 8% salary restoration. So dopusvi.org, click on the employees and then click on 8% salary restoration. Enter your last name and the last four digits of your social security number. You will then get a report of the anticipated amount of the repayment. Remember, this is a gross pre-tax calculation. Let me say it in layman's term. This is your money before we, the government, take our taxes out of it. We thank you for your contribution. We want to make sure that we don't miss a soul. So please check it. And if, you, if, it's, if your name is not there, or something is wrong, please call the Division of um, Personnel. I am so excited about this. I'm just beside myself that we were able to give this uh, payment out of the general fund. After so many people have created all kinds of ideas to pay this back, we're paying it back out of the general fund in our first term in office. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank the legislature and our esteemed Senate President, Donna Fred Gregory, for her leadership in helping to make this happen. Um, that's what happens when we work together. There are also instructions on the website for the survivors of the deceased employees that were affected by Viesa. So if you have a loved one that passed, there's a way that you can access these funding um, that is due to your loved one. Um, but make sure that you dopusvi.org these checks are coming out within the next two to three weeks. Um, so get ready and please, if you haven't done so already, set up a nice little savings account or a little um, investment account, look a piece of land or something, make a worthy investment with this. You know, one of our things as a government and administration is we want to make sure that we're giving you as much support as possible to bring you and your family into a higher realm, and a better earnings. So look for a piece of land, make a little investment, buy something, you know, cars are depreciating assets, but some of you need a new car. It's time you, you know, reward yourself. But do something for you that's going to keep giving you down the road. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, I have with me today a very special guest, our Senate President, Donna Fred Gregory. And she's going to share with you a little about what we're doing up here in Denver and the National Council of State Legisl Legislators at the BI cannabis son of it summit so without further ado i'll go to madam president um to give her remarks thank you good afternoon governor and thank you for this opportunity uh of course we are in colorado the mile high mile, mile high city of denver and um yesterday we started our conference and it was just a packed agenda we 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 got so much information around the role of regulators, banking and taxation, social equity, economic impact of cannabis, just so much information, public safety, you know, how, you know, what is going to really take for us as Virgin Islanders to move forward. It's one thing to move the legislation forward, but it's another thing for us to really move forward with implementing, which is going to require heavy lifts. So that's why I'm very happy that the governor um, 
said yes, that he would come out to um, Colorado with us and he brought uh, you brought your team members. So they too can understand the significant or the magnitude rather of um, moving forward with such a legislation. So I'm really looking forward to us working together and moving this uh, legislation forward. There is a lot of things that we did not contemplate when we initially uh, worked on the legislation. So this opportunity that we have um, is a good one because we are now able to see some of the, um, or hear from the folks in Colorado as it relates to their growing pains and some of, of what they've had to, to do as far as you know, implementing legislation to uh, improve you know, some of what they were doing and to improve it for the lives of the people in, in, uh, in, in Denver overall. So I think it's a good opportunity. Um, we are going out to a, today we are in, in sessions again and uh, we have an early day, but tomorrow we have a very long day. We are going out to see some large grows, medium grows and small grows. We're looking at processing plants, um, also the dispensary. So it's an excellent opportunity for us to really glean from what, you know, how Colorado has implemented. It is, Colorado is a, or Denver rather, is a leading state. Colorado is a leading city within the, the, the cannabis business. So this is the perfect place for us. Of course, we are hosted by the National Conference of State Legislators, which is, uh, this is where their headquarters are. So it, it really worked out for us as we, uh, as I planned along with my colleagues for us to really come to, uh, to Denver and really look at, you know, how things are, how has evolved around um, cannabis. Um, the, the public safety component is something that we really need to pay very close attention to. Uh, the, uh, you know, ensuring that our youths are in fact safe. Uh, youth education and prevention is a critical component of um, us moving forward with this legislation as well. So there's a lot for us to contemplate and talk about and really sit down. I think we can't, you know, one, no one individual within our um, institution can really move this legislation forward. It's just so involved and so complex. So it's going to require not only the work of um, our legislators, but also the work of our um, the OCR, as well as the Cannabis Board, as well as the, the executive branch in order for us to really move forward with a significant uh, piece of legislation that we could really work with and implement so that we can, you know, we, we don't have to be left behind in um, overall what's happening throughout the country as it relates to cannabis. Thank you, uh, Senate President. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the Senate President and her staff for putting this summit together. And I want to thank the National Conference of State Legislatures for bringing together the subject matter experts who are bringing a wealth of knowledge and information on all aspects of establishing a safe, well-regulated and profitable cannabis industry. We have the benefit now that the industry is maturing in many places across the nation like Denver to really get a good understanding of the lessons learned and implement them early. I am really looking forward to our continued collaboration with the 34th legislature in moving the legislation to establish this industry and thank Senate President Donna Fred Gregory for the invitation to participate this week. Nothing is as ever, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. This is one of the rules that I live by. Any task or mission that we as an administration embark on is carefully assessed before we make a decision to proceed. Every time we start a new project or initiative, it takes a tremendous amount of resources to get it done. Whether recovery or local funds, federal or special project dollars, it always takes time to get done and it is way more complicated on the ground than initially suspected. Cannabis is one of the things that we have been working on for over two years. And as we learn more, we become better acquainted with the task before us. But we have to start and constantly move the ball forward. It's like building a house. You think about it for a long time, about what to do and what to put in it, but you gotta start. You gotta buy the land, get the plans done, and let's, you know start digging that ground. And then you constantly, every single day, move the ball forward. This is why I am always about the urgency, as it will take at least another year and a half to get this industry up even if we approve that legislation today. This summit though, it is really giving us the ability to build trust 
an understanding between the branches on what is needed to bring new revenue into our treasury. It is the collaboration and trust that is helping us bring more opportunities to our people. We have it on our delegate and our Washington team, and we certainly have it here with the 34th legislature. I want to thank Madam President for her foresight and look forward to getting this done this year. I'll take any questions from the press uh, while I have you here. Uh, Let's see Knights St. Croix Avis. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, can you hear me? Sure, I hear you just fine. Thank you. Awesome. So, Governor, I just have one question. Um, I was hoping that you could get into some of the challenges that you found on the ground in relation to the to the cannabis industry and the implementation thereof, because you um, you're speaking to your urgency and commitment to that. Um, and we're referencing two years that have passed and then another year and a half. So I, I was just wondering what specific hurdles are standing in the way of implementation of uh, standing up this industry. Thank you. Well, the, the, the biggest hurdle is getting it approved by the legislature uh, right now, but we seem to be moving on that. You see, the medicinal can cannabis doesn't really have any money in it for the territory. It doesn't generate any money. So establishing costs as, as far as setting up the office, picking a uh, executive director and then paying them a salary, having a seed to sales system that manages the process, organizing and convincing somebody to invest in the laboratory equipment that will be needed to evaluate that product, doing all the rules and regs and assessing uh, the, in the places where the, the um, cannabis will be distributed from, the regulation upon uh, what is uh, medicinal, what is not, and how those things can uh, play forth. Um, one of the things that we're seeing with the recreational is, you know, as they call it, the, the bud, they call it the flower. Um, a lot of uh, recreational use now is not around smoking, um, but it's vaping and using different type of products and edibles. Um, all those things would have to be set up at home. Uh, we can't move edibles, uh, edible cannabis from one jurisdiction to the other. So all the packaging um, that goes in and around us and presenting brands that people know for a relatively small market all of that will have to be in, in effect recreated in the Virgin Islands because if you have, uh, let's uh, compare it to say you have Oreo cookies. Um, you can't take those Oreo cookies from New York to St. Saint, Saint Croix. You would have to make those Oreo cookies in St. Croix, package them in St. Croix and then distribute them. Um, it's, a, it's a very small market comparatively uh, to other places like Denver. So I'll be interested how many entrants we have and then how to distribute the, uh, the franchises. Uh, personally, um, we, we have seven franchises on each island. In, in my estimation, those franchises will be worth at least upwards of four to five million dollars a piece, um, generating about two to three million dollars in revenue uh, annually um, for and in terms of revenue to the business. So how do we do that in a fair way that allows us as a government to get the maximum amount of money um, into the coffers and at the same time have the social justice and equality that will make sure that our our uh, our residents, our people, uh, get a piece of of this industry because we're setting it up uh, certainly from a revenue basis, but it's important to the administration and to the senators alike that the local people get to participate in a way um, that brings uh, a great product to an industry to the people of the Virgin Islands. Awesome. Thank you very yeah, much for that go. detailed answer. Thank you, Lasiba. Uh, uh, Ernest Gilbert, the yeah, consortium. Yes. Gov, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, a few questions. I also have one for the uh, Senate president. Uh, but Gov, uh, like you said, on being on the ground there, you, you brought forth a very detailed comment. Um, you mentioned, however, that medicinal don't necessarily have money in there. I remember during uh, your campaign season and even while promoting the, the um, passage of the then medicinal marijuana bill, uh, you know, proponents of the measure said that we would, we would see revenue. 
Um, why the different take now? Is it that a deeper dive has been done and, and we realize that indeed medicinal marijuana is not beneficial and we need to go the, the full way? Remember, remember uh, thank you for that question, Ernest. Remember, the reason why we set up medicinal marijuana was not as a revenue generating. It was, a, it was to allow our people to be able to access the medical benefits of marijuana. It wasn't something that was done for money. What I campaigned on was adult use cannabis. And I was using this as a way to uh, fund a retirement system. Um, one of the things that we don't talk to about, a lot about is my plans to really create a patenting and research system within the RT Park at the university. Uh, once we start getting patents on some of these, um, these products, uh, we can then have companies getting patent royalties uh, nationwide or, or, or globally for that matter, reverting those monies back to the Virgin Islands. That's where the real money I think in this is. Um, we have a really small uh, market, uh, smaller than we think. Um, I, I know the census is gonna be making some announcements um, today, I can't even, I won't preempt that, their discussion, but it's going to, it's going to be shocking some of the, the information that's going to come to light uh, once they produce the numbers, the, their initial numbers that they're finding. So, you know, this whole thing is about how does the Virgin Islands participate in a global industry and at the same time be able to capitalize on the, on the, the tra captive market we have with the cruise ships or overnight guests and some of the people in the Virgin Islands that choose to use this uh, product re recreationally. Governor, you, you made a critical point there uh, in speaking to uh, one of my colleagues there in response to um, Lasiba, uh, when you spoke to even, even you know, the business sense of, you know, uh, opening a medicinal marijuana industry in the territory, whether it would be worth it uh, for the players, you know, when you speak of economies of scale and whether our market right. is, is, is even uh, worthy uh, of such uh, an investment. And so being on that trip, I, what did you find out I mean, in, in, in relation to that? Is, is it worth it? I mean, it's not worth it, but I mean, it's, it's the same way that we give our hospital services to all our residents. Um, you know, I always often tell people government is meant to be effective, not efficient. And I argued this term with a good friend of mine, uh, John Abrams, and I never forget the point he made. He says, government, if the hospital was meant to be effective, it serves all the people that come there. If it was meant to be efficient, it would only serve the people with insurance. So when we think about rolling out government operations, especially on the medicinal marijuana side, it's not really about making money. It's about making sure that our people have access to this new, uh, form of therapy on the on the recreational or adult use side it's a way to fund um, and subsidize those people who have uh, maladies that may be affected by or better by uh, cannabis be able to access them i always say you know people should be um, very upset and bewildered if if i encourage everybody um, to try a cbd product product they have topical ointments for aches and pains just like you would ben gay for any other product and when you see how quickly this uh, product works, it kind of it's a kind of a, a feeling light to over over um, over 50 years now by people saying that this is somehow bad. Um, I, I also want to point out to the public that our administration also uh, initiated the first hemp board, and we actually have hemp production going on in the Virgin Islands now. I think we have two licensed uh, growers um, for the hemp side, so we're learning a little bit about that and the differences between the hemp and the marijuana. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of considerations and a lot of uh, reiterations of how the cannabis product is being pro um, produced to the public. Uh, lots of new products that we never heard about before. Um, so, like I said before, it's great being here in Denver and learning. Okay, Governor, one more for you, and then the, the Senate President. It's it's really in relation to the uh, easing of restrictions you announced for clarity. So mm -hmm. outfits such as clubs can now host up to two fifty, and you know, uh, with mask and social distancing as much as possible, and folks are allowed to dance, right? So, for example, uh, uh, if, an outfit if, like Starlight can operate. Yes, um, but like what I'm what I what I said too is. Anybody who's having those um, maximum gatherings as, that are going up to that, they are for only for vaccinated only. If there are going to be a mix of people in there, the usual 100-person restrictions are still in place. 
Um, I suggest club owners to check with the Department of Health and get an established protocol for what they're going to be able to do. Technically, clubs and cabarets are still closed, um, but they have been open in some form of capacity. Uh, people just adjust and serve drinks or whatever, have sit down, uh, uh, serve meals or whatever, or run bingo. Uh, we, we put a lot of pressure on the club owners over the last year and a half, so I'm happy um, to announce the, the reversion to dancing again, especially for the club owners and also for our wedding planners. I mean, you know, we have a lot of t weddings in the territory, um, and we want to make sure that those people have the full enjoyment of their wedding. Um, going into the tourist season, we're doing it a little ahead to see, you know, what happens. We're going to be paying close attention to what happens within this next 21 days. And then we'll be making some more decisions after that. Gov, a quick follow-up. Has the implementation of the uh, vaccine uh, portal, uh, our portal for uh, Americans vaccinated in the States, has that been implemented? It has not. Um, I really have my mixed feelings on that. Um, I could tell you uh, my cabinet members are pushing me towards that. But I really feel uh, safe have making sure that people who are not from here, they're not residents, um, get tested. I mean, best case scenario, we want to test everybody, residents, but we understand the strain it puts on our community. So we're allowing for vaccinated people to travel back and forth without that. But, um, you know, if we're going to be having the kind of season that we've had last year. I want to make sure those people coming down here are vaccinated and um, are tested. But if not anything else, making sure that they're tested before they get on that plane. Um, because you all know it's just how about trying to manage the COVID once it gets out of control. Okay, thanks, Gov. And if I may ask the Senate President a quick question. Um, uh, Senator uh, Fred Gregory, are you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, two questions. The first one is is in relation to some reports I'm getting that the the the, the trip itself, while very informative, uh, brought a lot of of issues that the territory faces on its path to the legalization of recreational marijuana. So uh, many areas that we are just not prepared um, is what I'm hearing uh, is 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 a consensus that is being formed there and. So what we might see when we, we, we return home is that, you know, folks are, more, are even more hesitant uh, to uh, approve it than they were prior to the trip. Uh, is that the, the, the kind of consensus we're getting, listening to, to those uh, being on the ground there? Um, no, I'm not certain where you're getting the messaging from. But what I will tell you is one of the things that the, the most definite takeaway from yesterday's um, extensive discussion. We took a deep dive into, you know, the role of regulators, the public safety component, and the regulatory structure. And the, the definite takeaway is that it's going to require a heavy lift. So I believe that if we have concerns around the implementation, if we're hearing that it is folks who are not confident that the territory would be able to um, do the heavy lifting. Uh, by the mere fact that the chief executive of the territory is on the ground here says to me that him and his team is prepared for the heavy lift. We do recognize that, I mean, I recognize rather because I'm giving you my perspective that in order for us to implement this um, legislation, the adult use component and, and the medical uh, component in earnest, we are going to have to seek outside consultants and get the necessary support in order to get it done. But I do believe as Virgin Islanders, it is something that we can do, but we have to make that commitment. I've seen where Colorado um, has shared with us their growing pains and the areas where they've had to, they've, they've had to make changes to their legislation. I think one of the primary concerns is uh, you know, tied to youth education and prevention. Um, you know, th those individuals that are, are not necessarily in support of this particular uh, piece of legislation, 
uh, they're basically concerned about youth education and prevention. So we have to make a, a commitment as a territory that we will um, ensure that the youth education and prevention component, and there is that marketing component, those ads on television and in the schools and just wherever you go. So there must be some level of commitment. So from my perspective, no, I think the takeaways has been great. And it, it, the takeaway basically says that it's going to require us to definitely um, ensure that whatever we draft, whatever we enact rather in, our, in the legislation is going to require a little more than we did before. So I look at it as where there are challenges, there are definitely opportunities. And I see this as an opportunity for us to, to move forward, but most definitely it requires a commitment of all of the leaders, not only from the executive branch, the legislative branch, but the boards that are also responsible for the implementation of uh, medicinal and adult use in the territory. So long road ahead, Senator? I, I would say it's a long road. Um, when I went in the discussions this morning in particular, um, uh, Colorado shared that they, uh, they, they moved the, um, the implementation in 2012 and they were not able to see the benefits until 2014. So it took them two years to actually stand up the whole system. So, you know, we've been talking about this for quite some time and we have to get to the place where we're going to vote this up or down so we could, could move forward with standing it up. So um, it's, it's a long road ahead, but I think Virgin Islanders are, we're resilient people, we work hard. So we have to make a determination whether or not we want to make the heavy lift. We want to do the heavy lifting around this. So it's on us. Last, la thanks, Senator. Lastly, and in, in, in the um, interest of the public, so one of the things you, you, you've been seeing out here is that folks are saying, well, almost the entire Senate um, went to this event. Um, the executive branch brought folks and, and some other agencies. Um, folks would like to understand what is the justification for almost the entire government uh, heading to Colorado? Well, I don't know. I, I think you're um, when you said almost the entire government, that seems a little excessive. But what I will tell you, I can give you the justification from the legislative perspective. So remember, right, most of us and I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, all that I know about cannabis, for the most part, let's just use marijuana because that's what it is. OK, all that I know and many of my colleagues, all that we know of marijuana is based on our personal experiences as well as um, what we've heard. We don't really know for sure what we, we didn't understand the components of the regulation, the banking and taxation, uh, the public safety component. You know, you just hear things. I, I I saw this as an opportunity for elected leaders to really look at the the you know this. They have to make an informed decision first of all. So as we make informed decisions, we should not make those decisions in a vacuum. We should make those decisions based on. On, on all the factors, all the information that is um, provided to us. And I saw this as an opportunity. We have a lot of new senators that were not involved in the conversation last term that really need to understand the, um, you know, the, this industry. And, I've, and, and since the it's 12, 12 senators are here, and since they've been here, I mean, many of them have walked up to me and say, you know, this is really excellent. You know, there are things that I didn't understand. And now I have a better perspective. Um, there's so much research material that we've been that has been shared with us. In addition to the fact that we are able now uh, on this particular trip to go out at the to see the grows, to see the processing, to see the true system, to see what it takes to really implement what we've been talking about for the past two to three years. All right, Senator, thank you. Governor, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Thank you, Ernest, on that. That was, was an excellent answer by our very own Senate president. Is that when we created um, last three, four years ago, there was the horse racing bill before the legislature, which they approved um, all of the anti doping and the, the new rules and regulations and all the stuff that's needed for horse racing. It still hasn't been done. It's four years later. Um, so, what I'm saying is, these things are a process. When we first introduced casino gaming to the Virgin Islands, all of the rules and regulation weren't done. I think what the what we're trying to achieve here is trying to move forward the legislation first, and then put in places in terms of the resources. Because when the cannabis, the head of the cannabis uh, director of uh, office of cannabis registry, moves uh, a piece of legislation to say, "Listen, I need a hundred 
thousand or two hundred thousand or a million dollars to do something, the people behind the scenes understand that this money is needed because they've already been to the manufacturing. They know the, necess the needs of the lab. They know the regulatory requirements. So, you know, the the, the biggest hurdle right now is just getting the legislation passed. But it's going to take us another year and a half, two years to get all of the things right so that we have the first dispensary open. And that's why, you know, we're up here uh, studying this now. So I really want to thank um, the the senator again for that uh, awesome answer. And there are people up here that, that, that don't support the legislation, um, that want to delay on this. But if you come to Denver, one thing you, you, you cannot um, miss is the fact that this train has left the, um, the station a long time ago and the Virgin Islands is way behind, especially as a tourism destination and capitalizing in this industry. I don't, I see the Daily News. Any questions from the Daily News, Suzanne? No questions from the Daily News. Okay, folks, um, we got a, we're doing a lot of work up here in Denver, long days. Um, we're going to be doing some live interviews and stuff from here as well, keeping you updated to all the things that we're doing. Um, you know, I always say whatever it is we want in the Virgin Islands, you have to invest to get the best product, uh, whether that's investing in, in terms of paying the consultants, the attorneys, crafting the legislations, consultants to come and help us create and, and respond. But you can't do what you don't know. Um, so we're investing right now in the creation of a safe and really uh, cannabis industry that's designed to benefit our people and the retirement system of which I originally um, got this together for and trying to remember that, you know, it's going to take a while. So we need to take bold steps, move ahead, uh, get the initial piece of legislation and we'll be back again because certainly even today in Denver, there are changes being made all the time and they're pointing out things that they still uh, needs to address. So until I uh, next time um, I see you, I hope you have a fantastic day. Uh, love you and take care. God bless. Stay safe, stay sanitized.